Science for Everyday Decisions, series by Center for Sustainable Development at the Earth Institute, Columbia University. For your consideration for a more sustainable life through education for sustainable development. This is all right for everyone to be recorded online and we can, uh, um, you know, uh, We'll host it on our website. We'll make sure that we have, you know, discussions based on this presentation. Not all of our eco-ambassadors can join in one time. So we'll just make sure that we uh, use the presentation today for uh, discussions later on. Meanwhile, uh, there are a couple of us who are here. So feel free to join and feel free to ask questions in between. Um, so we can, you know, interject in between and also ask. Maybe you can do a quick introduction about yourself, your school, and your work, and how did you uh, come up with this idea, and uh, and then do your presentation if it's all right. And thanks for really, you know, taking the time to join our Eco Ambassadors talk today, and uh, thanks for leading this session. Hope you yeah, make Okay. Um. So I'll start with um a brief introduction, a very short introduction. I have a more detailed introduction of myself in the presentation. So I'll start sharing my screen. Um, okay, I might need a tiny bit of time to do it. There is this green button uh, down. I don't know. Yeah. If you can see. Yes, great. Okay, let's see. This should work. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay. So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Min. I'm currently a junior at the Lawrenceville School, um, located in New Jersey. I'm yeah. Well, next slide. Um, so I attend the Lawrenceville School, as I said. I'm a junior, so I'll be graduating twenty in twenty twenty one. So next year. Previously, I went to the Fay School, which is um, a junior boarding school located in Massachusetts. Um, as, a as a brief introduction to my work, I'm a member of the Lawrenceville Visual Arts Council. Um, I'm the graphics editor for the 140th Board of Lawrence, which is our school newspaper. Um, I'm the graphics editor for the First Amendment, which is our school, uh, it, which is a student publication at our school. Um, dealing with politics and um, broader news. Um, I'm the arts editor for the working title, which is a creative writing student um, publication. And I'm a member of the Lawrence Full School Climate Action Club. And I'm from South, South, South Korea. If you guys have any questions about like my experiences, you can just jump in um, and throw me some questions. So starting with what I do, um, I am a student in high school. I do um, arts, I do research, and I have um, great interest in sustainability, um, environmental sustainability in particular. So I try to combine all these three interests that I have. Um, so all three are, of these are um, photos and screenshots of what I do, um, the, the one on the left is one of my graphics that I did for a publication. Um, and the two photos on the right, I will explain. So on, um, um, these are some of my artworks, just in case you guys wanna see. Um, I do photos, I do graphics. I just um, kind of I have a question. Yeah. Um, when you say graphics, does that mean you do like online art or do you do it like drawing? So by online art, you mean like digital art, right? Yeah. yeah. So I do, um, by graphics, I meant digital art for um, student publications, not necessarily, not necessarily like portfolio style mm -hmm. fine art but more like um, more casual 
almost like um, news delivering kind of drawings and paintings, often digital sketches that would um, go in our school newspaper or um, school magazines, basically. All right, thank you. No problem. Um, I do sculpture and painting and so on. Um, and so on to research. Uh, I had, well, I've completed two research projects. Um, no, I, I completed multiple research projects. Um, I have one related to sustainability going on right now. Um, and I wanted to introduce you to two of the Re uh, two research projects that I did over the summer. Um, I did a summer internship uh, last summer um, at a nonprofit NGO called I4SD. Um, I4SD works in collaboration with the United Nations um, and it focuses on accomplishing UN SDG goals, which are basically sustainable development goals, um, as you can see from number one to 17. And another research, um, which I will dive into more detail, is um, the research that I did at Mariposa Center for Girls, which is in the Dominican Republic. Um, I conducted a research on eco reconstruction and the environmental activism class um, in the Mariposa Center. Um, and I focused on what they did with this particular um, structure that was, well, pavilion that was made out of a eco bricks, um, which you can see from here. So my research in the Dominican Republic was basically a case study. Um, initially I went there uh, to, uh, to do volunteer work um, as a community service project, but then um, the, the, the people at the Mariposa Center uh, gave us a tour around their campus and I thought that this pavilion was extreme, like, extremely interesting and thought it would be a good thing, it would be a good subject to conduct a small research on. So um, while I was, while I started and while I was at the Dominican Republic, um, I conducted a research on the pavilion itself and the environmental activism class, which were, which was the class that basically started this project of collecting eco bricks and that launched this entire community wide um, eco brick structure building process. Do you guys have any questions about, well, questions about the details on um, this pavilion or the research project? Should I go into more detail? Yeah. Okay. So, the, this pavilion initially started like nine, um, around 2010 with the idea of one of the co-founders of the um, Mariposa Center. And it was one of her small interests that she saw, well, one of the things that she saw um, as she was doing her own research project, browsing through um, environmental systems environmentally sustainable um, construction. Then nine years after that, um, after the Mariposa Center became a much bigger community, um, they, uh, the center launched this new program called the Environmental Activism Class, um, led by 15 and 16 year old Mariposa girls. And as, a, as the first launching project of their environmental activism class, they decided to do a community-wide, a municipal-wide um, eco-break construction project. 
that collected will, will, that will be all of this information um basically um made well it inspired the local community to reduce plastic waste um, and look back at their environment, how beautiful it was, um, while they while they also compensated for um, the volunteers' work with um, some some money, like twenty pesos per eco brick bottle. And I have a quick question mm -hmm. for the girls who are part of the Mariposa Center. Um, is that open to just anyone who is interested within the community, or is there kind of an application process or some kind of selection and recruitment, or is it just like open door roll, rolling admission? It was a very open roll admission, I'd say. Um, the management and the process planning was done by the girls girls um, in the environmental activism class, but they wanted as many people to, par to participate as possible. So they had people um, basically from the entire Puerto Plata region, which is almost like, um, which, is a big, which is basically a big city in the Dominican Republic. Um, they had people from many towns participate. Um, members of the Mariposa Center, people who were not part of the Mariposa Center, volunteers, tourists, um, basically anyone who was in the region who were willing to do a good deed for the environment or benefit themselves by collecting eco bricks since um, every eco, for every eco brick the center gave 20 pesos to whoever brought it in. And then the bottles they bring are found in, this actually came up in another one of our um, discussions. Someone was asking, oh, how, how do you get the bricks, um, the, the bottle? So are they collecting it just from recycling centers or just what they see in their, in their own garbage? Are they kind of saving it and then bringing it in? So it was, it was these bottles came from different locations, but um, they were mainly collected from the streets or from gardens mm -hmm. or from people's houses right because the Dominican Republic doesn't have a well-managed plastic waste system yeah so um before the project I've heard from the um one of the instructors at the center um though though this entire cabaret region was a very touristy, I mean, tourist heavy place. Um, the streets were full of plastic bottles, plastic waste, um, garbage from tourists, garbage from um, local citizens. And basically all of the materials that were put in to make each of these eco bricks were from um, the streets or from places where they shouldn't have been. Okay. So it was a form of plastic sequest, um, sequest, uh, sequestering, mm -hmm. um, just like how basically you would, you would find, um, say like a plastic bag on the street and you would pick that up. People would do the same thing here. Mm -hmm. Nice. Great. So though I, know that not everyone knows about eco bricks um i wanted to do a little kahoot like just three four questions to see um what people know if, if anyone knows about eco bricks and to have a smoother introduction to um our topic so if people can go to kahoot.it and enter this game pin, that'd be great. You'll have to answer the questions a bit quick because most of them will only provide you with 20 seconds to answer.
Oh my god, I'm getting worried about my answers. I hope I will not be. I hope I won't fail. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm think I, I guess people selected another plastic bottle or chip wrappers um, as what would go in an eco pick. Um, but yeah, glass shards and foam. Oh, oh, everyone selected glass shards. So um, basically anything that isn't plastic can't really go into eco bricks. Um, just for, because eco bricks have to maintain, well, be very stiff, um, but they can't have the outer layer, based, which is the plastic bottle, break. So you can't have glass shards. Foam doesn't count because it can't provide the rigidity to support structures. But yes. Chip wrappers work because they're made out of plastic. Most of them are usually non reusable. Okay, next question. Um, there are organizations that have, that provide um, education and certification of levels of how, prof like how much of a professional you are in making eco bricks. But as I said, um, you don't have to be a professional or you don't have to be certified to make eco bricks. You can basically pick up a plastic bottle um and shove in any type of plastic waste except for foam any type of non uh non-reusable plastic waste which makes i think eco bricks even more interesting because anyone can make it so what are some of the uses for it um I mean, like eco bricks what are some of the uses oh okay so um I'll say it again later, it's in the later slides, but um, eco bricks, as, as our name suggests, are basically, can, are usually used instead of bricks. Um, they're usually used for construction of um, smaller structures, like the pavilion or um, a, a little shelter, um, even a bulletproof shelter. Um, the Mariposa Center also had like a bench made out of eco bricks. So when you say bench, like it can be, but the, there is no, if there is no norm of how to make it, how will you make a bench and say that, yes, it is stable enough and it's like, you know, usable. So are you asking like, how would you I be sure that? Yeah, what are the quality standards to make an eco brick if you're making a bench out of it or making a wall out of it or whatever you make? Mm -hmm. So eco bricks, when you make them, um, you would you would usually, well, you would most likely fill it um, with so much plastic waste that it would be extremely dense and heavy. Mm -hmm. um, not like shoving in um, two plastic chip bags but it would be like probably 10 or so um, mini plastic bags inside so that they're a little less than a kilo mm -hmm. or um, two, a little less than two pounds. After a structure is made though of eco bricks, is there like locally, like local someone from I don't know, either the community or municipality who comes out and kind of checks it off as like, oh, okay, this is like safe building, kind of like building codes, you know? Um, in the Dominican Republic, they did, they did not have that. Mm -hmm. um, but the center itself uh, did multiple rounds of inspections. 
mm. on the quality of the eco bricks they had um people well they had girls they girls um step on uh plastic bottles to test how rigid they were how sturdy they were they went through about two to three rounds of inspection per bottle mm. um and they made sure that there wasn't any foam or there wasn't any um composable well decomposable um materials inside the eco bricks mm -hmm. nice okay should we move on to the next question So the specific pavilion in the Dominican, the, the um, Mariposa Center in the Dominican Republic um, used about 6,200 eco bricks to construct that little pavilion. Um, and if you convert that into kilos or pounds um, of plastic waste, that would have most likely um, polluted the marine environment of the Dominican Republic. I think you can think about how great the impact of this um, project was. Mm -hmm. And each brick you said was a little less than one kg. Yes, or two pounds, a little less than two pounds. So I've, I heard from multiple um, Mariposa girls and instructors about how drastically different the um, roads and the city looked like after the project. Before the project, they said that they couldn't really see anything green, despite um, them having grass um, and having all these trees and a beautiful beach in front of them because of the amount of plastic waste that was just littered in the city. Um, but after the project was done, um, they said that they've never saw their community so clean. And um, I visited about six months after the project was over, but the community was still clean and the local people um, sort of I think realized how beautiful their community was, how they, how beautiful their natural environment was. And I could see that they were, they weren't repeating the same mistakes as they did before polluting the environment. Okay, and we'll move on to the next question. Is this like before or after you like did this project? It's in general. So it's not just the city, but it's the Dominican Republic in general. The systematic, the governmental mismanagement. All right. What do you mean by mismanagement? Min? So Nidhi is asking, what do you mean by mismanagement? Oh, by mismanagement. So by mismanagement I mean not having a proper um, plastic management facility for example um, you would have uh, recycle bins in front of your houses in America right but in the Dominican Republic recycle bins aren't really a thing it was it's extremely hard to to spot um, recycle bins or any system that 
helps um, or that allows people to uh, basically manage their where their waste is going. So most of the times people would just throw away their plastic bottles on the streets instead of um well instead of you know putting it into a plastic recycle bin which would later be sent on to a um facility that cleans the plastic bottles and reuse them melt them make it into new plastic products okay And though 25% seems like a low number, I see everyone selected 43%. 25% um, plastic waste mismanagement converts to about, um, about 300,000 kilos of plastic waste every day that's mismanaged and all this plastic waste would eventually pollute the environment whether that be the water um, of around the Dominican Republic where people go surfing where people go swimming um, and everything or in the ground they would eventually um, become microplastic and be consumed by the people of the of the Dominican Republic and build up in their systems. Mm -hmm. um, compared to the Dominican Republic, which has 25% mismanagement, um, the U.S. generates uh, about 38 million kilos of plastic waste per day but 0% of those plastic waste are mismanaged after use. So you can see how different the impact of plastic waste mismanagement or plastic just generating plastic waste would be on the US and the Dominican Republic. I like the little shout outs of the <laughs> quiz. <laughs> Congratulations, Anna. You won the game. So good job to everyone. Um I thought I was going to fool everyone um and have zero answers, but <laughs> <laughs> good job. Um okay, so I'll explain more about EcoBricks. As I said. Ecobricks are basically plastic bottles filled with non-decomposable plastic waste. Um, they usually look like the image. Um, uh, if you want to use Ecobricks for construction, you would usually pack it so that they're more dense than what it looks like here. Um, Ecobricks don't really aren't a solution to eliminating plastic waste but they're more of they're more a form of sequestering plastic just like how um, people promote carbon sequestering people would promote um, eco bricks it's just like how trees hold on to carbon dioxide eco bricks hold on to non-reusable non-decomposable plastic waste um, apart from the example of the Mariposa Center in the Dominican Republic. There were multiple successes, successful examples in Africa, like there were multiple NGOs that built um, bulletproof shelters made out of eco bricks for um, uh, uh, societies in Africa. Um, and since they, they're made out of non-decomposable and non-reusable plastic waste, they basically last forever. So you don't have to worry about, you know, your structure rotting or having, you know, cracks due to the 
um, the the characteristic of plastic. So it's almost you you use the cons of plastic, which is being non reusable and non decomposable, and you make that into a good thing through making eco bricks. And as I said, eco bricks can also be used um, to uh, make other items like furniture. Like I saw, um, people make couches um, and like ottomans out of eco bricks. Do we have any questions about eco bricks? So Kim, yeah. my question is, um, so should I be guilt free uh, consuming soda in a plastic bottle now, knowing that somebody in Dominican Republic will get a shelter from it? No. <laughs> um, eco bricks is, as I said, is only a way of sequestering plastic waste. And by you consuming soda in a plastic bottle, you're basically generating um, more waste. And not everyone makes eco bricks. Eco bricks are only an example and a partial solution to plastic mismanagement. Okay. And so for the young eco ambassadors, it's important to remember that the biggest problem is generating plastic. So that certainly needs to be stemmed as much as possible. And then if we do end up with plastic, we do need to manage it better. And this bottling is, uh, you know, eco bottles and eco bricks are just one way of doing that. But most importantly, we need to just stop production consumption as far as possible, right? Right. If there's, if there's no production of plastic waste, there would be no need to produce eco bricks. Okay. And that would yep. be the ideal solution. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Thank you, yeah. No problem. Um, so I think I'm going to move on to sustainable art and what I do to promote sustainability through my other interests, which is art and research. So I want to define sustainable art for you um, so that it would be easier for you to understand. So I searched it up in Merriam-Webster and they said, such thing doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> so I searched up uh, definitions for sustainability and what it is to be sustainable. And it's basically, if you are being sustainable, you are acting in a certain manner of conserving um, resources so that you um, so that you can still have those resources available for you in the future. And I I think it'd be easy easier um, if you think of it as rationing, almost like rationing food. Say you have three baguettes to last three weeks. If you know how to do division or if you do not want to starve, um, you would most likely ration each baguette into seven pieces for each day. So, oh, well, seven pieces so that you each a piece each day. This is a great uh, lesson for a quarantine period. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and it seems so obvious when I, when I use the um, baguette example, but then when we reflect back to what we're actually doing, our current situation, um, we, we're at this pace, we're gonna run out of gas in 50 years. Um, not, well, we'll run out of oil in 50 years, we'll run out of natural gas in 53 years, we'll run out of metal, um, and we'll run out of different animal and plant species. You've probably heard of turtles eating um, plastic bags that float around in the ocean, thinking that they're jellyfish, and then eventually, you know, being found dead. 
and plastic mismanagement and lack of environmental sustainability is basically uh, rooting back to the example, um, rooting back to the baguette example is basically eating all three baguettes at once and not leaving any for later. And so I want, through sustainable art, I wanted to deliver the message that we don't really have much left. Um, this is another example of what's really happening in our globe right now. So for example, um, climate change, we've already crossed the boundary. We can't really, there's no way for us to stop it. We can, we, we can only be, we can only slow it down. We, all, we already have too much biodiversity loss, biochemical loss. Um, and what I hope through um, producing sustainable art is inspire people to realize this truth and at least stop um, all the other earth system processes from turning red in the boundary cross section. And I want to show you guys um, a recent project that I did um, for a uh, environmental sustainability um, gallery or presentation. I mean, if, sorry, if you can go back mm -hmm. to the previous slide. Yeah. I just want to mention that, you know, see for us who are climate, you know, uh, people who are trying to do their best, you know, in every day in our living, in our living styles and in our discussions and other things. I feel that even if we have crossed these planetary boundaries for biodiversity loss and climate change, we should be at it because you have crossed the boundary, but you can be much worse. You can every year the carbon emission can increase every year there will be, you know, the temperature is rising we have crossed almost crossing the four degree um, uh, per year increase in uh, you know temperature so i feel that yes we have crossed the boundary but we shouldn't really give up on these goals because they are they are they'll be you know there is a limit to where you know all this can go so i feel that you know giving a message that we have crossed the boundary and so now we need to focus on other goals might just be a little bit dangerous for all of our understanding because yes, we have crossed the boundary, but you know, things can be much worse and they can be, you know, so much of, you know, the, you know, biodiversity loss and other things can still happen. Uh, so we need to be very, very careful um, so that it's not like, you know, saying that, yes, we have crossed the boundary. So let's forget about it because it's, you know, we need to move on to other other goals so just making that clear to everyone i know you are already focusing on things and i know all of us are conscious um, but also think of all the things that can happen by uh, you know with the tipping point has already crossed in climate change biodiversity by biodiversity losses and other things that you mentioned but we still have to be at it and cannot be we cannot miss the point of uh, you know striving towards a better world right Right, I definitely agree. Um, just because we cross the boundaries doesn't mean that we have to sprint um, on to worsen the situation. Yes. Um, even though we cross the boundaries, we can definitely um, slow the process down. For example, climate change, um, reduce carbon emissions, make it at least better so that we can last longer. And if I can just um, sh share something really, it really moved me was, you know, you have number four ocean um, acidification. And I just saw on the news the other day, the Great Barrier Reef of Australia, um, all the coral reefs are um, kind of dying off. And um, <laughs> yeah, and it was quite alarming to see the visual. But then watching that news, I remembered an event that was hosted by the U UN um, UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program where they were awarding innovative thinkers and, and young 
um, it was a, I'm forgetting the exact name, but it was like an earth um, award. And I remembered there was someone who was working in the Bahamas and he was basically cultivating and making coral reefs and putting it back into the ocean, doing it in a lab and then putting it back into the ocean to revitalize. So I also think kind of the message of hope is kind of what Radhika was saying, like keeping the fight going. And there are just so many innovative things being done to address these issues. And that also like that innovation can't stop either. That needs to pick up much more as well. Definitely. Okay. Um, so we'll move on to, um, as I said, one of um, my recent projects uh, that was inspired by the Eco Brick Research Project. Research project. Um, this project, I basically wanted to deliver a message to um, the audience that what's inside the Eco Bricks, the, all the plastic waste, all of this, what what we would say is gross waste actually comes back to us um, if they're not sequestered, if they're not managed properly, if we keep on generating them, they eventually come back. Um, you would have read it, you would have read about microplastics in many, many um, news uh, medias that even the air currently, our, our, the air um, has microplastics, the water that we eat has microplastics in, um, food has microplastic in it and it didn't used to it was never like this before um and through this I, I i i wanted to say or i wanted to evoke like a discomfort basically to people by making them think back at what's actually happening to them um And based on my experience with the EcoBrick Respirator Project, um, I'm planning on making more um, sculptures and art that's related to, uh, to environmental sustainability to provoke people um, and to promote um, environmental, environmental sustainability, um, tell people the reality, how dangerous um, how, how dangerous it is um, if we continue to go on this current directions. Do we have any questions about the project? Okay. Um, I had a few questions um, for the group. Would you mind if I ask you guys questions? Please go ahead. Okay. Um, so I defined, I defined my definition of sustainability and I gave the, the Merriam-Webster's definition of sustainability. Um, and, I, and I know that I focused more on environmental sustainability, but I wanted to know what sustainability the the general term of sustainability of sustainability meant to um all of you um eco ambassadors very good question ayan has a answer yes so so like about like one and a half years ago when i wasn't so aware about the environment and i didn't start this eco ambassador um club i used to think that this word sustainability was just like sustainable just meant like it could hold up on its own, like a structure or like a world that could hold up on its own i never knew it was so like related to the environment at all on the and this climate change thank you anyone else Is there anybody else who wants to say anything? Any any kid? No. So um, can I chime in? Of course. Yes. 
Yeah. So uh, uh, I'm thinking of sustainability as being able to regenerate self-support. And I would like to uh, borrow from Ayan's uh, definition too, Ayan. So you were, I think, very right that it can be self-standing, self-supporting. And I think that is the core of sustainability. That, you know, if you put it on a path, it can uh, continue on a path uh, uh, on its own without requiring any additional um, uh, resources, if you want to call it that. Uh, but I think the primary idea would be to be uh, self-supporting, uh, self-generating, and um, would that be good? Yes. Thank you. Um, and this was a question that I've had that I that I got um, while I was working on this specific project. Um, I was wondering how other people. Um, Eco ambassadors in particular would deliver the message of environmental sustainability to the public. This art, pro this specific art project was my way of delivering a message about how we should wake up to um, plastic mismanagement and plastic uh, waste production. But I was wondering how all of you were doing. Um, to send a message to people who were not particularly invested to this topic. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can chime in here. Uh, uh, let me just share my screen if I can. Uh, is it all right? And then I can get back to your screen. Of course. Yes, five minutes. Uh, let me see if I can. Oh, can you see my screen? Yes. Um, okay. So here, you know, sometimes we feel, especially now, I feel that sustainability also includes an element of health in it, which we forget because we say sustainability and I've seen a lot of people just taking the environment aspect of it. So I just wanted to uh, go back to a few, in, you know, com big conferences that defined sustainability. So 1992, the UN Conference on Environment and Development. Um, this was the Earth Summit in 1992. It adopted Agenda 21. And that's where the environment and, you know, sustainability elements started to uh, seep into our language. 2002, we had this World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg that brought in a lot of the you know the sustainability language 2012 um, sustainability started to be defined in not just environment because earlier on before 2002 it was all about environment and it was all about you know building human and equitable and caring global society and it was more about you know environment but 2012 there was a clear shift the, the language of sustainability then started to focus on social, economic, and environmental dimensions. It was not just uh, environment. And so I feel that um, the four pillars of sustainable development, which people forget, is, you know, four pillars are, as defined by the UN, is economic development, which includes extreme poverty, social inclusion, which includes health and education and other goals, and especially health goals now, and environment, and of course, good governance, which includes peace and security, which was the lost pillar and, and was suddenly rediscovered in 2012. So just, you know, my, uh, my take on sustainability is that we should not just focus on um, just the environment pillar, this environment pillar can only, yes, see if we're looking at environment and carbon emission and everything, but look at us right now. Are we living in a sustainable world? No, we are all confined to our houses and it's because we are lacking this climate uh, goal, which is a part of what sustainability also defines for us. Right. So just my bit on uh, focusing on sustainability in the widest sense, mm -hmm. which includes a lot of different dimensions. Yeah, what you said really relates to um, one of the things that I didn't mention here, but um, was surprised um, when I was working at I4SD and while I was doing the research 
research at the Mariposa Center. Um, I personally think that sustainability, environmental sustainability, um, is intertwined with um, economic and social uh, sustainability. I don't think they're exclusive from one another. For example, the Mariposa Center, um, they promoted economic sustainability and social sustainability through providing a chance for um, the local citizens to, you know, prop to profit themselves from promoting environmental sustainability. And the entire, pro and the entire um, concept of the Mariposa Center is to educate girls so that they escape generational poverty and have a better future for themselves. Perfect. Those were basically the two questions that I had for you guys. If you guys have any extra questions, I'm willing to answer them. Thank you, Min. I think this was very, very fascinating. And thanks for doing this work. Um, you never told us how did you manage to go to DR and what you know promoted you to um, you know travel and uh, got in. You, you of course you mentioned why you got into the you know eco bricks part. But uh, your initial intention of going to DR was to do what? Work with the Mariposa on what projects? So the first time I went to the Dominican Republic was. Um, in ninth grade during my freshman year while I was still at Fay, um, at the Fay School. Um, our entire class went to the Dominican Republic for a service trip. And there, though I was, I, I didn't work for the Mariposa Center, but um, working for the local children, um, teaching them, watching how they live, I thought, that life in the DR was extremely different from what I was expecting, from what it would be. I was originally expecting it to be amazing, beautiful nature, um, beaches, um, trees, greens, and everything. And I realized that poverty in the Dominican Republic didn't really allow space for that like environmental sustainability and the consciousness for environmental sustainability is almost like a privilege for first world countries. Like the Dominican Republic doesn't have the leisure um, or space to consider promoting environmental sustainability because they're so busy trying to, um, trying to better their economic situation. And I thought, this country, um, which, and I also saw um, gender disparities while I was a volunteer for, uh, when I was a volunteer with my um, peers. Um, and I thought it'd be great if I could come back to the Dominican Republic, um, didn't have to be uh, the same organization that I work for. It could be anywhere in the Dominican Republic. And I thought, this place is worth, um, definitely worth um, developing, like not just economically, but becoming a better place. Like there were so many things that I learned um, after I went to the Dominican Republic initially. Um, and after I was, after I, um, was introduced to the chance of going back to the Dominican Republic a year after that um, to help educate girls, um, volunteer for them, uh, better the better their environmental sustainability, share my experiences, and get to listen to their experiences um, because I didn't really have the chance to talk one on one or have a more hands-on experience with the with the tighter community in the Dominican Republic. I thought it would be great to go back, and I and when I heard of it, I was just like, "Yeah, I'll, I'll totally go." Thank you. Are there any questions? We're almost out of time, but uh, maybe a couple of more questions, and uh, then we we'll let Min go. And uh, she's traveling also soon. 
So mm -hmm. thanks, Min, for taking. Not not a question, but I just wanted to kind of commend your artwork. I think just seeing it in a very different way um, that is really powerful, and you know, it's kind of reminding me that in addition to all the things and discussions we're having you know being able to use different medium and just art as you know it speaks for itself and i just think you did a fantastic job on that um kind of mixing the eco bricks but also conveying a very strong message i thought it was really well done thanks for the talk thank you great Okay. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll be in touch with you, Min. Uh, thanks for uh, doing the presentation. It was uh, you know, very interesting to, again, cover the art bit and also the eco bricks. Um, so thank you so much for working in this direction and striving towards sustainability. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.